Welcome to this free immigration help channel. Today is May 15, 2024, and we are getting into the volume 208 of me answering your immigration related questions. As always, before beginning this video, I will mention, as I mentioned in every video on this channel, I am not an immigration attorney. This is not legal advice. All the information provided in these videos on this channel uh, is directly from official government sources like USAS and of course the Department of State with their visa bulletin. So let's start with the very first question, comment from user EG9CG, sorry, sometimes YouTube does not show me the names. When I apply online in blank, in quotes middle name, it is not allowed me to put the slash sign shift. What should I do? Great question. So normally with online applications, if something is not applicable for you, and that's what I'm, I'm assuming you're trying to type in, then and slash a um, just leave it blank online applications whenever you're filling out the online applications that rule with the blank spaces does not apply the blank spaces only applies to the applications that you're gonna fill out on the computer or, or in the PDF print them out and then mail them so the paper applications that you actually mail those are the applications that USAS, they don't like the blank spaces left. So those you need to fill out. Um, if there is, if you are mailing something and if it does not allow you to put it in on the PDF file, that's fine. You can print it out and then write it out just with, you know, with a pen and just writing the not applicable in the blank spaces. But with the actual online applications that you do through the USCIS website, through the USCIS portal that you create to file an application online. I know there are some confusion with people confusing doing something on the computer and then printing it out and filing it by mail and then the actual online application. Yes, both of these applications you can type out on the computer. That is true. But one is exclusively submitted online and another one is printed out and then mailed. It's the same way you can print out a regular, the PDF of I-589 in your case, and write it out by hand. The only reason why we do it on the computer through the Adobe PDF reader or whatever is because it makes it a lot more legible because people have different you know, handwritings and my handwriting is horrible, so I'm way better off typing it out and then sending it to avoid any kind of confusion, any kind of mistakes made by the immigration officer, misinterpreting what I wrote. Um, so yes, if you're referring to the paper application that you will file by mail and you're filling it out on the computer in the, in the PDF Adobe Reader and it's not allowing you to type in something, that's fine, just, just leave it there. Once you print it out, then go back to it and finish it up and put the not applicable or whatever it is you need. If you are doing the actual online application through the USAS portal, then you should be fine. You don't need to put not applicable in there. You can just leave them blank and you should be fine. If it does not allow you to leave it blank and it does not allow you to put a slash, just write out not applicable. And if it doesn't allow to have two things, two spaces, just not applicable as one word, uh, really whatever you have to do, but you should be fine in the online applications to leave them blank. All right, let me post the response here and we're gonna move on to the next one from Zena Na Najem or Nahem. Uh, Zena, thank you very much for being a member on this channel. I really appreciate it. So for everyone who's watching these videos, if you want to show support for this channel, make sure to join the uh, the membership basically all of the all of the everything that i receive through the membership it goes towards the translations of the most watched videos on this channel the most popular videos on this channel i translate them in the languages that are requested most of the times it is spanish that is requested so that's the language that i've been uh, translating a lot of videos to but if you have any requests for translations i do have a list of each video and which translation was requested let me know and i will uh put the money towards 
towards that. Okay, so question from Zena. Priority date F2B category March 14, 2016. US Embassy in Lebanon. Date of documentary qualification January 21. When can I expect to have my interview scheduled? All right, let's take a look at the visa bulletin. So you're already documentarily qualified. That's great news. Let's see what F2B looks like. So you're from Lebanon, so we're looking at all chargeability area. So F2B is right now, as of June 2024 visa bulletin, is on April 1st, 2016. And you are March 14, 2016. So March, April. So March before April. Sorry. So you are already current, which is fantastic news as of June. But let me double check the May. Let's see if there was any movement because we're still in May. So we might be waiting for a month to become current. Let's take a look. All right. So this is May visa bulletin. And yes, so you have been current in, in, uh, in May as well. Let's go back to April. And I want to see how long you've been current approximately. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So you see back in April, it was still on November 2015. Yes, so you were not current in April. You became current in May. So it means that about a month now that the US Embassy been working on scheduling your interview. Possibly your case is still somewhere in between NVC, US Embassy, and they're working on scheduling it. Possibly it has been already scheduled. Now, depending on how busy the US Embassy is in Lebanon, um, we are, you know, potentially looking at year, year and a half for the interview to be scheduled. Some of the countries that have heavier immigration flow, like for example, the countries that are on the visa bulletin that have separate chargeability area, like India, Philippines, for example. Philippines, I know they have about two, two and a half years after the immigrant visa becomes available just for the weight of the interview scheduled. Uh, but what I recommend you do is give them at least another three months and then reach out to the US Embassy in Lebanon and I will find the link Let's see, usembassy.gov. Let's take a look. So Lebanon, here we go. And the US Embassy is in Beirut. And I, if, if, if this is not the correct phone number, I'm not sure, it does not look correct, honestly, but I, I'm not sure, maybe it is. You can go to their website. Let's just go there and see if we can find their phone number through their Contact Us page. Okay, there you go. Now that looks a little bit more like a real phone number. So here it is on their main page. So I'm gonna add this link to response. Give them about three more months because you just became current. Give them about three more months and then reach out to them and say, hey, I've been current for three, four months now. I'm documentarily qualified. I just wanted to see when my um, immigrant visa interview was scheduled. Most of the times they say we can't give you that information, but it is worth a shot because in some cases it's an official announcement so they can take a look at their scheduling system and say, hey, your interview been scheduled or if not your interview been scheduled, they can say in general, f to be categories, family preference categories are right now waiting for about a year, a year and a half. But around a year is normal. So I would say, more realistically, you're looking somewhere mid 2025. Um, so I would say, yeah, give it another three, four months and reach out to the US Embassy and then another six months and then you can slowly start preparing for uh, your immigration interview by finding the medical examination provider, by putting all of the documents that have been used during the documentary qualification. Now you have to have the originals. Uh, so the petitioner has to file to send you the, uh, the original birth certificate because you'll have to take that to the uh, interview to present that. So you can start doing some preparation for that. All right, let me post the response here and we're gonna move on to the next question from the young, the youngster 
the youngest killer, 3055. If I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, where do I have to mail this to? And that was a question on I-589 application for asylum. All right, great question. So let me double check because I'm pretty sure that I-589 right now is available to be filed online. Let's see. I-589, there you go, application for asylum. And this is the official government website for US, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And let's see, the filing tool provides da, 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 on the, the provider tool does not determine if you're eligible for asylum. Yes, there you go. So below, whether you may file your form online or if you must file by mail. So use this filing instructions tool. Figure out if you're able to file it online. If you can't file it online, I highly recommend doing that because it just saves it saves you time that's for sure because you don't have that time between you know you mailing the application them receiving the application them putting the application on the desk of the immigration officer that's going to be reviewing it it's straight from you know once you pay the fee online it's already submitted and it's already received by USS. another reason why it's good to file online is because it prevents a lot of mistakes that you can potentially make in a paper application or just simple confusion whenever it comes to the handwriting you avoid that so if you can do that do that but to answer your question if you have to file it by mail let's take a look let's see where we are filing this what that? So there should be there you go so if you live so you're in las vegas so las vegas nevada where to file with uss by mail if you're not required to file your form i-589 with the asylum vetting center as indicated in the special instruction section then use this chart to determine where to file okay so we got florida georgia maryland new jersey pennsylvania texas so you're none of this you're nevada any other state territory that would be applicable to you so if you if you mail it using the usps which i would recommend if you do have to mail it use usps instead of i don't know maybe i'm biased because that's personally that's all of what i've done but if you're using usps you're sending it to this address right here po box if you are sending with fedex ups dhl so that's the couriers then you're sending it right here so both go to chicago one goes to p.o box and one goes directly to their basically front desk or whatever so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna post a response and i'm gonna post this page right here and you can find the same thing that i showed you under where to file right here all right let's move on to the next one from Amira Bar 77, after 36 days to apply I-539 by mail, still I did not receive any response, no receipt number, and my payment is not cashed. Ooh, what should I do? My visa will be expired in the next two weeks. Oh man, that is close. Okay, so the it's I-539 application to extend, extend and change non-immigrant status. That's one of the reasons I recommend filing online, if you can. If you can file online, if such an option is available for you, file it online because that's what one of the things it prevents. Another thing, if especially with I-539, if you don't wait so close to file the extension change change of non-immigrant status, apply as much as you can in advance. If you can apply three months in advance, great. If you can apply six months in advance, fantastic. Do that. <coughs> but Amira, to give you response to your comment 36 days it's been it's not particularly unusual it can take a month and a half possibly even two months because when you file a paper application and depending on what you used if you used whether you use usps and file it to po box or the fedex dhl uh, ups to send it to their front desk there is amount of time between that front desk picking up that mail and delivering it in within their building to the immigration officer that works with those applications so there is that amount of time there is amount of time this application is sitting on the desk of that immigration officer before they actually open it, open it up 
and start reviewing it. So 36 days, you have to keep in mind for mailing, let's take a week. So take out the six days out of it, then you have the 30 days. Obviously, we don't count the, um, the weekends, so it's just the business days. In you know, within 30 days, you have what? Saturday, Sunday, four times. So take out uh, eight days out of the 30, you have 22 days. So that's about three weeks that it has been sitting. It's not outside of anything abnormal. A few things that I would recommend you take a look at. If you send, whether you send it USPS or UPS, FedEx, you should have the tracking number. So take a look and see, first of all, if it was delivered. I'm sure you probably already checked that, but I still wanna cover that because we start from the basics. Make sure it is delivered, take a look at when it was delivered, and if you requested the signature, if it was a PO box, then you didn't request the signature, but if it was a courier, maybe you requested the signature, see who it was signed by. That's number one. If it is delivered, when it was delivered, all right, we cover that. See how much time it's been after it was delivered now. Um, now, you can reach out to them and you can go through the customer service and it, it does take a long time to go through the prompts in order to reach a real person through their, uh, through their phone system. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably going to take you like at least 45 minutes to reach a, a, a real person. Unfortunately, they made it that difficult to get to the real person through that. Unfortunately, but you can do that and you can talk to them and you can say, hey, you know, I just wanted to follow up, see what's going on. But, but if you look at the tracking number, if it's not delivered, if there is something, if the application did not get to them, then I would recommend going online and filling out the application online and submitting it online. Because the good thing about the filing the application online is that once you make the payment, it is already with USAS and it is already marked as received by USAS. And once it is received by USAS, that's it. Now you have that, it's not a very good place to be in, honestly, regardless, because whenever it comes to extending and changing your status, you're not in a legal status once your duration of stay expires. You're only in the legal status once your duration of stay expires, once your application is reviewed and approved. And obviously if it's, for whatever reason, if it is denied, then yeah, it's not a very good situation to be in at all. But at least you have that application received and pending. And as long as it is pending, Yes, you are outside of the duration of stay, but at least you know that, hey, you know, I'm good. So check on the tracking number, try to reach out to them, see if they received it, because if they did receive it, then it's fine. Give them a little bit of time, maybe another week, two weeks you have extra to send you the response that it was received. And once you have that notice of receipt, that's fine. You're just waiting now from that point. But if for whatever reason you find out that the application was not delivered, it was not received, it was lost or something along those lines, then I would, you know, just file it online as soon as possible, just to make sure there is an application that was received by them. Uh, but the fact that they have not cashed the payment, the fact that they have not sent you the notice of receipt yet, it means that they just didn't get it in front of them yet. It might not be a big deal because, like I said, there is time between the P.O. box and the actual immigration officer. So maybe it just didn't get to the immigration officer's desk yet. But we still want to cover all the possibilities because you are really close to your status expiring and you don't want to be outside of the normal, you know, outside of your duration of stay without the application being received by USAS. All right, let me post a response and we're gonna move on to the next one from Adina Rayana PVS. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing, 2638. I'm waiting for F1 visa slot, booking for full 2025. When I can expect it? Visa slot booking for full 2025. So, 
Adina Lemia or Adina Raya, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. So in order for me to take a look and, and for everyone who's, who's requesting um, the estimate for the interviews or the availability of the immigrant visa, because realistically, I can tell you a better estimate for the availability of the immigrant visa. Whenever it comes to the actual interview, we can only speculate depending on which country you're from, depending on how busy U.S. Embassy is in that country. But I need three things. I need the family preference category. You did provide that. I need the priority date, which is very important because that's how I can look at the visa bulletin and then the chargeability area. So those three things. So Adina Raya, if you can, please let me know those three things in a separate comment and I'll try to address it better. Visa slot booking, I'm assuming that maybe the U.S. Embassy in your country provides approximate times. So if that's what you have for you, fall 2025, then uh, you're looking at fall 2025. But again, to be a little bit more accurate with, uh, with the timeline, I do need the priority date. So please let me know that. I'm gonna post the response here, more info needed. And we're gonna move on to the next one from J Andy, 1705, hello sir. NVC Mumbai, India, F2A category, priority date October 2021, documentary date March 2023. According to Visa Bulletin, F2A is current. Already contact to NVC through public inquiry, but they said you are in line for interview schedule. When will they approximately schedule interview? Thank you. JND, thank you very much for your question. So congratulations on the be being documentarily qualified and being current. That's huge. That's huge news. It's, it's, it's fantastic. So it really depends on how long you've been current because right now the visa bulletin is on September 2020 and you are priority. Wait a second. You're October 2021. Oh, wait, you're India. Let's see. Never mind. Don't even listen to me. This is April 2024. We're looking at. We need to switch back to June. June 2024. All right. So June 2024, most recent one. Now we are looking at November 2021. And you are in October 2021. So October, November. So it depends on how long you've been current, because as you can see, back in April you still were not current. And let's see May. Let's see actually May, what May is doing on, there we go, June, aha. So you are June, 20, June 2021 and you are October 2021. Okay, so J. Andy, you are in October 2021. Right now we are still in May and in May visa bulletin for India, it is still June, which doesn't really matter because India is current with the rest of the world. It's still on June 2021. So as of May, you are not current yet. It is next month, the June 2024, that you will be current. So you will be current in two weeks now, which is fantastic news. Once your immigrant visa is available, that when, when you're current in the next two weeks, then the, the U.S. Embassy in, in India, um, Mumbai, in, you, 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 know, you already know it's in Mumbai, they're going to start working on scheduling your interview. Now, the great news is that, yes, your immigrant visa is going to be available in two weeks and you're already documentarily qualified. So the only two things you have left is medical examination and the interview. Not so good news is that Mumbai, U.S. Embassy, they're quite busy and I can tell from people commenting uh, from, from India and obviously you already know yourself, India has a separate chargeability area on the visa bulletin for that specific reason. It's because the immigration flow from India is heavier than other countries. So with that being said, you still are potentially looking at another at least year and a half, possibly two years before your interview is actually scheduled. And unfortunately, you're not going to find out when your interview was scheduled for only up until 30 days before the actual interview dates. And it's really sad that it is the it, it is how it is because they do that because you have to do the medical examination within the 30 days before the interview. 
I wish that they announced it as soon as they scheduled it because honestly, it's much easier to say, oh yeah, my interview is scheduled, you know, in April 2026. I know my date and I'm just, yeah, I'm being patient and I'm waiting, but at least I know my date. Rather than waiting up until March 2026 to find out that your interview was scheduled in, in uh, April 2026. That's an example. But that's, I would say, you, where you're looking at, I, I, I'd say, because you're from India, I'd say probably close to two years. Um, keep in mind that a lot of this backlog, not for the immigrant visas, not the availability of the immigrant visas, but scheduling of the interviews accumulated because of the whole pandemic shenanigans that was going on a couple of years ago and the embassies were closed. So maybe potentially we will see because they're all opened up and they're scheduling the interview, maybe we will see that time, the wait time coming down. But still, this is what we're looking at as of right now, year, year and a half in the countries that are not as busy immigration flow and about two, two and a half years in countries such as India and Philippines. All right, let's move on to the next one from user UK. Sorry, no name. Thanks so much for your response. I appreciate it. you're very welcome. I'm glad my response was helpful. Moving further to sun and stars. Hi again. Hi. So I am a US citizen bringing my husband from Nigeria. So does that place us in F1? We are still waiting for the interview letter, but I'm predicting by June or July, he will get it. October 20, 1.30 cent, September 8, 23, I-130 approved. Okay, so I-130 cent, I-130 approved in September. All right, all right, so October 22, all right. Wow, so you, you're almost getting close to being two years. September 11, 2023, file sent to NBC eight months ago, received a notice from NBC in March 24 that they were reviewing info. I assume the interview notice is coming. Thoughts? All right, so the great news is that you don't even need to look at the visa bulletin at all. Visa bulletin is not for you because backlog for you does not exist. Once your I-130 was approved back in uh, September 8, 2023, the immigrant visa is already available for your husband and is already waiting for him, basically, because he is in IR category, immediate relative. So yeah, so not F1, it's IR, IR1, immediate relative. But it sounds like approved, so it was approved in 2023 and it was sent to the NVC eight months ago. You received a notice from the NVC in March 2024 that they, are, they were reviewing info. So I'm assuming you already sent all of the documents for documentary qualification to the NVC. And I'm not sure if you already became documentarily qualified, but I'm going to double check just to cover the basics. Once you receive the notice to the NVC, from the NVC, they give you the case number and the invoice number. You logged into the NVC portal using the case number and the invoice number. You filled out the DS-260 for your husband the application for the immigrant visa, you paid for it. You filled out the affidavit of support for yourself to qualify you as a successful petitioner sponsor and you paid for it. You submitted all of the documents that are required like marriage certificate, birth certificates, police report, tax transcripts, and you submitted them to NVC. I'm not sure if NVC responded to you and said, okay, you are documentarily qualified, everything good or they responded to you on March 2024 and said that they are reviewing it. If they are reviewing it, that's fine. Give them some time. It's been eight months now, so I'm assuming maybe the first time you submitted for documentary qualification, they requested something else. There was some back and forth in there. Uh, but once they review it and they documentarily qualify you, they transfer the case to the US Embassy uh, in Nigeria. And yeah, from then on, the US Embassy in Nigeria, they work on scheduling the interview for, for your husband. Most of the times, whenever it comes to immediate relative categories, because the immigrant visa is already available when US Embassy receives that document package, that case 
from the NVC. They schedule it and it's between six months and a year. On average, it's about nine months um, ahead that the interview is scheduled. Um, but yeah, yeah, hopefully it is. Once it is scheduled, once you are documentarily qualified and if you are documentarily qualified or not, please let me know as well so that I'm kind of staying aware and on, on, on top of, you know, everyone's cases. Uh, but yeah, once it is scheduled, please come back to the channel and provide an update that would definitely be helpful. All right, let's move on to the next one from Mutam Bo Patrick 243 Hey, hey, thank you for being a public subscriber. Appreciate that. Let's move on to the next one from 12393. Thank you for being a public subscriber. Appreciate it. Hi, sir. My priority date 15 December 2009. India documentarily qualified date 17 July 2023. Awesome. I have received 60 day notice from the NVC when. I should expect my interview date. Yeah, so unfortunately those 60 day notices, you will keep receiving them and some people receive them, some people don't, but don't pay much attention to them because they really are boilerplate for the most part. But let's take a look at uh, the visa bulletin and uh, your priority date. So priority date is India. So December, wait a second. What is your family preference category? Okay, so if you can, please, I'm gonna request more information from you. I do need the family preference category to look at the visa bulletin. Priority date, family preference category, and then chargeability area. So if I look at the, this right now, India. Yeah, so you're 2009. So potentially maybe you can be F3 because you recently got documentarily qualified. But yeah, if you can, I would, you know, I'm not gonna do any guessing because, so I'm gonna request more info needed. And let's move on to the next one from Daphne. Hi, sir, thank you for helping me. They upgraded my case to IR2 and I'm doing my documentary qualification application now, thank you. All right, so they actually did upgrade it to IR2. That's perfect. That's fantastic. Daphne, I'm really happy. That is fantastic news. That's awesome. Yeah, so if you if you if you watch the previous volume and there was like a few volumes ago, what happened to Daphne is uh, unfortunately her attorney messed up and did not update the category of her son who was in the F2A category when Daphne became a US citizen. And the NVC, they changed the category to F2B, which is a huge difference between F2A and F2B because it is about F2A is 21 and F2B is, yeah, so five years basically. Five, because of the attorney mess up, this is how bad it is. This is why it is so important to stay on top of your cases. Because of the attorney's mess up, Daphne would have been waiting for her son for another five years to see him. You see how messed up it is? Another five years when her son actually was qualifying under the immediate relative category because Daphne became a US citizen while her son was in F2A. So if you are in F2A category and the petitioner becomes a US citizen, it is upgrading to the immediate relative category, whether your spouse or whether you're even more important son or daughter under 21. And if they are still under 21, when you become a US citizen, the age is frozen. In the immediate relative category, your child's age is frozen. So even if they are super close to being to turning 21, which was the case for Daphne, it doesn't matter. Even if they turn 21, as long as you upgraded the category to IR, it doesn't matter. That's it, the age is frozen and they can be 22, they can be 23 when their interview is scheduled, they still gonna be going there as a child under the IR category because their age was frozen when you updated it. And that's what the attorney should have done and they didn't. So that's one of the reasons why I keep saying all the time on this channel, even if you're working with an attorney you still have to be familiar from scratch 
with your case, with everything that is involved in your case, with all of the steps, don't give the responsibility fully. Now it's good, it's good to, uh, there's a lot of great immigration attorneys. And I had, I had a chance to actually, you know, to deal with a couple really, really good immigration attorneys. But that's a couple out of a large number that, that was not so good, unfortunately. And that's just part of the deal because you come in, it's a lot of money that you're paying. You're paying a lot of money in advance. So the person already got paid to handle your case that they have hundreds of these cases. So of course they're not going to pay attention to your case as much as, a, as, a, as you would have paid attention to your case. It's, it's, it's just part of the deal. That's how it is. You cannot blame the attorney for being like this because that's just how it is. When you're dealing with hundreds of cases, you're not going to be paying attention to this one case, your case, as you would have been paying attention to your case. So yeah, that's why it's uh, very important to <laughs> stay on top of your case, know the dates, know the process, know all of the steps, uh, because if any problem arises, you already know how to deal with it. You already know what to do with it. And really that avoids a lot of problems arising in the first place because you know what's going on. So thank you very much everyone for watching. Hopefully my answers were uh, helpful. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, drop them in the comments below. Just make sure not to respond to my comment within your comment. Submit it as a separate comment and uh, it will show up on this wall and I will address it in one of the next uh, volumes on this channel. So thanks so much for watching. God bless. And I'll see you all in the next video.